Welcome to our Wednesday night uh, fellowship and Bible study. Glad you could uh, join with with me and your faithfulness in being a part of this. I hope uh, that the study is being fruitful and being uh, beneficial to you. I know it's kind of difficult. I have a tough time uh, doing this and not having anybody in the room. And I know it's kind of tough to just watch it uh, on your phone or tablet or however you uh, watch it. But uh, thank you for being faithful in, in, uh, in joining with me. Wanted to do something a little different, be somewhere somewhere different than where I've been. Usually, I've been doing it in my office, and I thought, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go somewhere else. Maybe uh, we'll pr we'll play. You know, where where's Waldo? I, I saw a cartoon. I think it was on Twitter where it, it, it was called "Where's Waldo," and it was this huge huge auditorium, and nobody's in it, and kind of making fun of uh, what's going on where we can't be anywhere or do anything, can't be, be around each other. So maybe we'll play a game of Where's Willie? And you can uh, try to figure out what part of the church I'm going to be in and might might go to different spots. Uh, we may get a little bit of outside noise. I don't know if you'll hear it or not, but if we do, that's all right. That's uh, pretty typical on Wednesday nights. We can hear the cars going by. But uh, thanks for joining me. I'm going to take some time to pray. Uh, I have noticed, uh, it's been kind of funny as I've kept up with the daily devotions, I've kind of noticed that uh, uh, they're getting longer and longer, and I don't mean for them to. I, I said, we'll do five or six minutes, and and I think today's, uh, I hit eight minutes, and so I, I've got to be careful by, by the time this uh, virus is over, my daily devotion will be up to an hour and a half, uh, but uh, I enjoy doing those, and I'm glad to be able to uh, to teach a little bit, a lot of study, and I don't mind that. I love to study, so I, I enjoy the prep, the preparation and enjoy the prep for uh, Wednesday night. But uh, on our, our prayer list, there's no one new from what we prayed about last week. Um, still want to be in prayer for the Byers family in uh, the loss of Charlie's mom. And uh, Footy is still in the hospital up in in uh, Knoxville, and when she's cleared, she'll go to uh, the National Healthcare Facility in Farragut, so we wanna be in prayer for her. Uh, there may be other needs that you have. I know that obviously we wanna pray for the situation regarding the virus. Um, I think I've heard there's three or four cases here in McMinn County and they are all resting at home and recuperating at home, but we want to pray for uh, that healing, uh, pray for the scientists and the doctors to find a cure, a vaccine uh, for this virus, and not only for us in the United States, but around the world. And the biggest prayer request that I've got is that this will turn into um, a time of spiritual awakening. It's interesting uh, we were in the office uh, talking and uh, how now the simplest of things that uh, you can do become important. Uh, Joe was talking about it, that they went to Sonic as their as a family and their kids were so excited that they were getting to go to Sonic. Now, who would ever think uh, that you would get that excited about going to Sonic? We kind of take places uh, like that for granted. Uh, but maybe we won't take things for, as much for granted anymore. I, I know that, that we do. I think we take our lives for granted. We take our jobs for granted. We take our church for granted. We take our friends for granted. Uh, we take fellowship for granted, a family. I mean, you just uh, go down the line, and we, and we just uh, have always thought, well, these things will be here, and, and if I want to use them, great. If I don't want to use them, uh, they'll always be here, and we're kind of finding out you know, that's not true. So um, be in prayer for that. Uh, be thinking about when we are able to meet again, uh, who could you invite to come to church? And realizing that uh, I think this will open the door for a lot of people uh, who have never wanted to go to church before, have never wanted to have anything to do with church, or, you know, may have been part of the church in the past, and for whatever reason have not been coming, and um, you've invited them and they've not accepted your invitation that maybe now they'll be open to it. Uh, I know I miss it. I, I've 
uh, I, I love the church. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted not I wanted to leave West Virginia, but one of the reasons I was open to leaving was because I really missed the connection of the local church. Uh, I was in church, you know, every Sunday, but it was a different church, and it wasn't my church. It was uh, somebody else, you know, it was another pastor's church, and and um, it, they weren't my people. They weren't. It wasn't my congregation, and a lot of times I didn't know the people. And so uh, coming into a, a congregation where uh, it's part of our fellowship, I mean, this is the Lord's church, but he allows us to be a part of it. And so I, I'm thankful and uh, glad to be a part of the local church. But I miss you guys. I love you guys. Uh, we pray for you and our staff is praying for you. And we want God's uh, richest blessing to be on you. We, if you have a particular need, call us. If you just need somebody to pray with you, give us a call here at the office and uh, let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Um, let's take a couple of minutes and we'll pray together. Uh, pray for our folks that are in the nursing home. I, I guess that's the ones that I, I'm really the most concerned about just because of the loneliness, them having to be quarantined and sequestered like, like they are. And it's tough enough uh, when they're able to have visitors, but now they're not able to have any visits. I, I can't visit the hospitals, uh, so it's it's really tough. A friend of mine, a pastor friend, uh, did a funeral on Monday for a gentleman in his church who had died from the virus, and uh, he said he called me. I, I told him I'd be praying for him, and he called me on Tuesday to say it was just the oddest, most difficult funeral he'd, he'd ever done because the ways that we minister to each other um, in times of crisis, you couldn't do it. You, you couldn't be near someone. You couldn't touch someone. You couldn't hug them. Uh, you couldn't speak to them uh, for any length of time. And so um, it was just difficult. Difficult on him. It was difficult, I know, on the family. And so uh, let's be in prayer for those folks. And uh, I would encourage you that if you know some of our senior adults or some of our uh, homebound, give them a buzz. I, I know the staff's calling them, but I, I know they would love to, to get a phone call from anybody and just have, a, have, have someone make contact and let them know, hey, we love you and we've not forgotten about you. So join with me in prayer if you would. Well, Father, I, I'm thankful that, that we can meet together um, through the Internet. I'm thankful, Father, that, that uh, we have such a tool. And I know that there are those that have used the Internet for evil and for, for bad, and it has harmed people. But, Father, you can use it for good, and you are using it for good. And so we're able to broadcast our Sunday services and we're able to do this Wednesday broadcast and we're able to do our daily devotions and we're able to watch other pastors uh, preach and listen to other sermons and hear other teaching. And so, Father, thank you for that. Protect us in that. Protect us that as we're watching other things that we watch what is good and what is pure and, and what is sound. I know there are wolves in sheep's clothing, and so I, I pray protection for us in that. I want to pray for our senior adults, especially the ones that we have in our nursing homes, in our assisted living homes, and the ones that are homebound. And I pray, Father, that your blessing would be on them, that uh, the richness of your presence would be with them. And Father, uh, for our church, I pray that you'll continue to sustain us. I, I know that as we are moving toward Easter, we had several people we were supposed to be baptizing, and we're not going to be able to enjoy that. Uh, probably won't be meeting this Sunday. Um, and Father, it may be a few weeks before we can. It may be a month or more before we can. So Father, we need you to sustain us. May we not grow weary. May we not grow lazy. May we not lose hope. But Father, help us to 
stay strong. Uh, I pray for our families, and I know there's a lot of stress on the family, especially if uh, folks are not able to work and then having to be at home a lot. I pray that they'll learn to love each other even more than they love each other right now and that our families will unite, our families will grow, our families will become stronger through this. And Father, I pray that through this crisis that the gospel will go out and that doors will open where we can reach people with the good news of Jesus. Father, bless those that are listening and watching uh, this Bible study. And Father, make your presence so very real to them. And it is in the name of our Savior Jesus, the one who sustains us in his name, I pray. Amen. I, uh, again, I, I, I guess it was on Twitter. I probably keep up with more people uh, via Twitter than I do about anything else. Uh, do a little bit of LinkedIn. Don't do a lot of Facebook. So if you contact me through Facebook, I don't, I'm not on Facebook very often. I'll, I try to keep up with some birthdays and a few things like that. Don't spend a lot of time. I, I try not to overdo it on uh, social media, that kind of thing. I think you can get all caught up into that. But I saw a, uh, a friend of mine, a guy that I know, he, he, he tweeted out that, uh, that with, there's no sports, uh, new sports coming on. And he said, you know, I, I uh, was looking forward to, you know, uh, the new basketball season and, and there's nothing on TV. And, and he said, I went into the den and there was a lady there, a really pretty lady sitting on the couch. And she said that she was my wife. And he said, she seems nice. I look forward to getting to know her. So maybe that's going to happen. Uh, maybe we'll get to know each other a little bit better where uh, uh, we're not spending all of our time uh, on the television or on the phone or on the computer, those kind of things, but we're spending time talking with each other. Well, let's talk a little bit. We're, we're dealing with prayer and the foundational passage that uh, we were looking at is Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 6 where Paul is uh, dealing with, I mean, it's, it's one of the most wonderful passages that we can have uh, to help us understand how to overcome and deal with the anxieties that we face in life. And I've, uh, I've dealt with this passage. Um, but, but verse 6 says, To be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, is the way the uh, Holman Christian Standard um, Bible uh, translates it. It says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so it's understanding that, that God wants us to pray. God wants us to talk to him. But what exactly is prayer? I think for a vast majority of people, uh, prayer is nothing more than just a time to bellyache at God and tell God what I want. And a lot of times when we are weak in our faith, uh, that we may not be uh, very mature in our faith, maybe even not, not even believers yet, that we think, well, prayer is my way to tell God what I want. God's supposed to do it. And while there's much in the Bible that deals with the answers that God brings to prayer, and we'll deal with some of that as we walk through uh, this study on prayer, uh, it's far more about relationship. When we pray, it is through prayer that we walk into fellowship with God and a relationship with God. And I think, I think that's the aspect that so many people miss of how God reveals himself to us. And it's through prayer that we learn about God, that we meet God, that we encounter God, that we experience God. And then it is through prayer that we respond to who God is. Well, we, we've talked about, we talked about last time that, that God, uh, through prayer, um, 
shares with us his holiness and then uh, there is a proper response that we have uh, to holiness. Well, a, a second thing that, that we learn is what God reveals to us of what he shares with us through prayer is his joy and his blessedness. Now, you know this verse, John 10, 10, where Jesus says that a thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and to have it in abundance, to have it more abundantly. Uh, John 17, uh, verse 10, or verse 13, says this. It says, now I'm coming to you. And I speak these things in the world so that my joy, so that they may have my joy in completed in them. Now, I, I'm coming to you that my joy may be made complete in you. So what happens is, all right, think about, all right, think about how many times in our lives that life is spent upset about stuff. There's an incredible amount of unhappiness. Uh, we don't like our jobs. We don't like our families. We don't like, you know, just just go down the list of all the things that, that we're unhappy about. And it seems like a lot of folks spend a lot of time unhappy about life and unhappy about, about the, the things that are going on in their life. And what Jesus is is expressing to us and reminding us is that the reason why he came is that we would experience his blessing. When he says that, that my joy may be in them, that my joy may be full in them, that, that I have shared these things with you, that you may have an abundance of these, that, that the thief talking about Satan and the world, they've, they've come to kill and destroy, but I've come that you might have life, and that we would experience the abundance of life. Well, how often have we placed um, our joy in the possessions we have, in, in all of these physical things, and now all those things have been taken away from us, and you wonder, they, uh, I know watching the news and things like that, they talk about how one of the fears going on is that there's going to be a rise in uh, in suicides uh, because people have lost their jobs, because people can't do the things they've always done. Well, when our entire life is, is wrapped into the things, uh, the physical things of this world, what happens when those things are taken away from us? Well, there's no joy. There's no happiness. Well, Christ came that we might find life in him, eternal life, but life, I believe, that means living life, of experiencing life. Well, the result of that, you say, well, what, what should that result in? How do we respond uh, to God when we understand that he brings to us uh, his joy and his blessedness? Well, the way we respond to it is through our praise. Look at Acts 16. Verse 25, you've got Paul and Silas that are in prison. And it says, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, they're, they're in prison, and, and, and the assumption is that the punishment was going to be very severe. The punishment possibly could have been death because when the, the the earthquake happened, the doors opened, the Philippian jailer was getting ready to take his own life because he knew that as the jailer, these men escaping, that he, would, he was to suffer the very penalty that they were going to suffer. And so they, they, they had a very, very uh, severe punishment that, that they, they were facing. You know, they were beaten. Verse 23, they laid, when they laid many stripes on them, they threw into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them uh, securely. 
And so he, having received the charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in, in, in the stocks. And so, I mean, this wasn't an easy prison sentence. And yet at midnight, as they were praying, notice their praying wasn't, God, get us out of this. God, why did this happen to me? God, I don't understand. God, I don't like this. God, it's not fair. God, why me? They were praying and singing hymns. And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, why, why were they at that point? The reason is because they had such a relationship with God. They were in such fellowship with God that they knew that God was going to take care of them. One way or the other. I mean, I don't think that's why Paul would say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That God is going, whatever happens to them would be in the plan and the purpose of God, and therefore they were not worried about what was going to happen next. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty amazing. That here are two men in prison, and they're not worried about what's going to take place next, what's going to happen to them. And so the response is that they were singing and praising God. And, and I think even what's more amazing, it said that the prisoners were listening to them. I, I doubt these were um, good men who had been falsely accused who were the other prisoners. Maybe some of them. But I have a feeling that uh, in a Roman prison of, there in Philippi, but a Roman prison that they had a lot of hardened criminals and people that would have mocked God, would have mocked Christ. The two uh, prisoners that hung on the cross next to Jesus where one of them mocked him and the other one, you know, condemned or, or told the, the other the other prisoner, don't do that. I mean, this man is a man of God. There's hardened criminals there. And they're listening to Paul and Silas as they're singing and praying. That says multitude of, multitude of things, but uh, two things that it kind of said to me is that instead of, uh, that when I'm in trouble and struggle, does it drive me to my knees not to complain to God, but to sing to God? Do I have such a confidence in God? Do I have such a fellowship with God and a relationship with God that when I am in trouble, when things go bad, that I praise Him? Now, I don't know about you, but I that's not easy for me. Probably not easy for you. Uh, a lot of you know, uh, we. I, I've told people that I, I'm going to change my name to Tom Hanks and uh, star in the money pit because I, I've just had to do an incredible amount of, of work on, on my house and... and uh, it's just crazy things that have happened. I mean, it's not the builder's fault, not the, I mean, it's not anybody's fault. It's just, you know, crazy things. You buy a house and, and uh, things like this happen. And uh, I was uh, going to have, uh, having our master bathroom redone uh, for Judy and for me, but for her, for her birthday and for our anniversary and those kind of things. And just something nice so it'd be what, what she would like. And workers uh, showed up Monday and they were going to begin the demolition. <laughs> and they were pulling out the cabinets and yanked on it and hit a pipe. And I we had water going everywhere where they couldn't find the shutoff valve. So water is going from the bathroom down into the basement. And it flooded, flooded, <laughs> flooded the basement again you know and uh 
I, I'm Murphy's Law. I think we're going to change it to Hennard's Law or Hennard's Law, you know, Murphy's Law. Well, then they, they uh, and that wasn't their fault. The pipe, for some reason, you know, the house isn't that old, but the pipe, uh, it was a PVC type pipe, and, and but it was brittle for some reason, and it, and it broke. Well, then they were working on the shower and got a little, they got a little careless with it, I guess, whatever, and it broke and water's going every which way. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I had to rush home and we're cleaning up the basement. Good news is I, I had the flooring redone in the basement and I put in uh, a, and I'll go ahead and brag on the product. Uh, it's a Pergo product that uh, it's, it's a laminate that is water, supposedly waterproof. And I am so thankful I had that, I put that in because it was waterproof. It did not bubble up or buckle up or anything. I mean, there's no evidence of water damage on, on the floor. So very, very thankful that, that I did that. But the point is, um, I don't know that I was thanking and praising God that much while I'm driving home. You know what I mean? Uh, wasn't angry. I was just frustrated. And it's one of those things, you know, God, why me? God, why me? And then I come to realize, you know, long and short of it is perhaps it was a blessing that that water pipe broke because if it was brittle and maybe it was just a bad piece of pipe because he you know, contractor came and looked and was testing out the other pieces of pipe and said, you know, they're not bad. So it may have just been that one little section was just a bad piece of pipe. Who knows? But if that had happened to me and I had no idea where the shutoff valve was, um, I'd have been in deep trouble. We, we'd have probably just installed a swimming pool in the basement because I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have known what to do. Eventually, I, I think I would have headed down like he did to the, to the road and turned, turned the water off at the road. And I am having a shutoff valve put in a very convenient place. So that if anything crazy happens, uh, I'll know where to go. But see, in the long run, that's a blessing. Maybe, maybe you know, God allowed that to happen so that there would be people there that could fix it and then it's preventing a greater tragedy from happening later but at the time you know i'm not spending a lot of time praising god for that after the <laughs> i'd say the dust settled after the water got got uh soaked up uh vacuumed up uh and i thought about it i thought you know i, I need to spend time in things like that praising god and learning to thank God for that and say, God, you know, I'm thankful that this happened because there's something that's going to come out of this that's good. You're going to take care of me and whether or not I've got to spend more money, you know, fixing stuff. I mean, all of those things are ir ir irrelevant because Christ came and he brought to us life and life that's abundant. The other thing I think this says to us is to be so very careful with our words. I think that it's really easy to become whiners and complainers. Uh, uh, another pastor friend of mine was mentioning uh, uh, on something, he, he was talking about how, you know, when, when they first, he, he's in a small church, not a real small church, but smaller church, and he he was saying, you know, when they first started doing the videos and doing everything online, that everybody thought it was great. And now that a few weeks have passed, he, he's getting the complaining emails. You know, somebody complaining about the sound or complaining about the video quality or complaining about the website or complain. You know, what I, he lists several things that people were complaining about, and I you, you wonder. I guess one is we have way too much time on our hands if we're spending time complaining about things like that. But then you wonder, no, you know, it's no wonder that that non-believers don't want to have anything to do with the church, especially if we're saying those kind of things to our neighbors. And uh, that's why I don't like Facebook because people can post things on Facebook or Twitter or 
any of those things, and I think you've got to be, be so very, very careful. If you'll notice, I just rarely say anything on Twitter. Uh, I'll like what somebody says. I'll retweet what somebody says if it's really good. Uh, I, I spend a lot more time just trying to encourage people through it. But when we spend time complaining about things, insignificant things, what happens is, one is, I think we become like the boy who cried wolf. We're always complaining about stuff, and eventually nobody pays us any mind. But I also think that it gives us that reputation where people don't listen to us, especially the world. Again, if Christ has come to give us life and to bring life to us, the response that we must have is that of praise and prayer, not of complaint. And I share with you the personal story, you know, that, that I had, because I want you to know I, I struggle with it too. I mean, it's not like I'm, well, I'm going to tell you what to do because I've got all this mastered. Uh, we all struggle with that. But I, <coughs> I don't want the world <coughs> to get the impression that, uh, that I'm a complainer. <coughs> Excuse me. And I didn't bring any water down here with me. <coughs> Talking about water. Um, I, I don't want the world to look at me and say, here's a guy who claims to be a follower of Christ, <coughs> and yet there's no life in him. There's no joy in him. So when God gives us his joy, we respond with praise. Well, another thing that God uh, reveals to us is his unity and his glory. Look, look at uh, John 17. This is the prayer of Jesus. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, and you've heard this before, um, what we usually designate as the Lord's Prayer is actually the model prayer. This is how you pray. The disciples said, how do we pray? And Jesus said, our Father who art in heaven. John 17 is actually uh, the, the prayer that Jesus offers. It's an incredible prayer where he prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then beginning at verse 20, he actually prays for us. And here, here's what we have in, in John chapter 17, beginning at verse 21. He says, well, verse 20, he says, I don't pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. So the people that will believe through the word of the disciples as they preach and as it, it goes through. And then he says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us and that the world may believe that you sent me and that the glory which you gave me, I've given them. And they may be one just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And so through prayer, one of the things we learn, we learn it in the word, but we learn it in the relationship and fellowship that we have with God. We learn of the oneness of the Trinity. Uh, think about this. Here, here is the holy God who reveals himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. And yet they're not competing with each other. Uh, you, you think of how many times in the world that there are such competing factions. It's why uh, you know a lot of churches have tried to have co-pastors and that hasn't worked out well because... You have the one group that likes the one and doesn't like the other, and there's two competing men of the, of the same value and the same same level, and it's it's in, in human terms, it's just a very difficult thing. But in God's terms, it's possible because Jesus and the Father were never in competition with each other. Jesus was never trying to one up the Father. Uh, there wasn't uh, the game going on, a button, button, who's got the button? You know, who's in charge? And, and trying to push weight around and things like that. There was a perfect unity, a, 
a oneness that was within the Godhead. Well, what should be our response? When, when we're in prayer, <clears throat> how do we respond to understanding the oneness of God? The response is the mutual accord or the church being in one accord, the oneness of the body of Christ. Uh, let me go to several passages. One, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 14, talks about that the disciples were in the upper room. Remember how Jesus said, wait for me, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So they did. And verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, in prayer and petition with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Um, chapter 2, verse 42. I'll go ahead and work through some of these verses. It says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. In Romans 15, Paul writes this, starting at uh, verse, verse 5. He says, Now, May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. To be like-minded toward one another. According to Christ Jesus. That you may be with one mind and one mouth. Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray and spend time in prayer with God. The response that we're going to have when we see his unity, when we see how the Father, Son, and Spirit are in perfect harmony, in perfect unity, a perfect oneness there, the evidence that we're, we're, we are praying and the evidence that we're walking with Christ is that there's a oneness in the body of Christ. Think about that. Now think about that. One of the evidences that proves that we are walking with Christ is the fact that we're one with each other. Doesn't mean we always agree on everything. I, I think there is room even in the opinions and uh, interpretations, not opinions maybe, but op uh, interpretations that we have of, of Bible passages, of certain passages, if you listen to the uh, devotion that I did this morning. I think that's a passage that it's open for interpretation. Uh, there are principles that guide us where we are all headed in the same direction so that regardless of the interpretation, the principles of interpretation keep us within a, a certain parameter where we, where we don't get out of bounds. It's not like, well, it's open to interpretation so we can go way off in, in the distance here. So I'm not talking about that, but within the parameters of solid biblical interpretation, I think there may be ways that we might interpret it differently. Now, ultimately, there's one interpretation and the correct interpretation, but in our finite, limited abilities, I, don't, I think there's sometimes that maybe we, we don't get it exactly the way that it's, that it's intended to. That's part of the, the dynamic of learning to interpret the Bible correctly. But even in that, there's unity. I'm not going to divide with my brother in Christ because his eschatology is different from mine. You know, the basic biblical principle is that we believe that Jesus is coming back physically. We, we, that, that is a foundational element of Scripture. But all the events surrounding that, I think there's, there's uh, a variety of interpretation with that. And we'll, you know, when Jesus does come back, then we'll find out which one was right. Doesn't matter because Christ is coming back. But, you know, I think it's open to, to that level of interpretation. Well, the fact is this. If we're walking with Christ and praying with Christ, 
The evidence of that is that we're in one accord with each other. There's a unity in the body of Christ. When the body of Christ is not in unity, it's not because you got one group right, another group wrong. When the body of Christ, listen to this, when the body of Christ is not in unity, it's because we've not spent time in prayer. Because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were always in union. And we've allowed uh, personal opinion or we've allowed certain things to come in um, to bring disunity to the body of Christ. Because one of the key factors, you say, why, why was the early church so successful? Why were they able to accomplish the things they accomplished? It is because through all of the obstacles that they faced, the church remained in one accord. They stuck it out together. They, they were in unity with each other. Well, I think kind of the bottom line is this, that if, if you are spending time praying, it is really, really, really hard to be angry with your brother if you're praying for him. Think about that. I know that's true for me, that if I am angry with a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ and they've offended me and hurt my feelings or whatever it may be, most of the time what I do is I stew on it. You know, I'm angry about it and so I stew on it and I, I like to go to the uh, Psalms and read with David, God, destroy my enemies, you know, make my enemies all miserable, those kinds of things. And what the New Testament calls me to do is to pray for them. And not to pray, God, heap coals of fire on their head, but God, bless them. God, take care of them. God, minister to them. God, give me an opportunity to minister to them. I'm thankful for them. And when we do those kinds of things, we realize that our anger most probably is seated more in selfishness than it is in righteousness. I don't know how you are, but I think the times that I've gotten mad at people, it's more of a selfishness than it is a righteousness. But when I pray for them, it changes my opinion about them. And that's why prayer is so important. I mean, the early church is just like us. I mean, you go to Acts uh, chapter 6 and... We, Acts chapter 5, you've got the, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira. That's a huge issue. You've got Acts, Acts chapter 6, where within the body of Christ, the needs of the church were not being met. Needs of the widows. And I mean, the church could literally, through chapter 5 and chapter 6, literally the church could have imploded. You think about it. The church could have imploded. They had an ethical what you might even call immoral behavior going on through uh, Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 6, the, the needs of their widows were not being met, and the church could have fallen apart. But, but the reason why the church, from a human standpoint, look at it from the human standpoint, the reason why the church was successful and the reason why the church was able to stay together is because they were committed to unity. The reason they didn't implode is because they were of one accord. See, the fact is the gospel's got to be bigger than petty differences. The gospel's got to be bigger than us. And that's what we learn from the text about prayer. Is when we go through trials in life, when we go through difficulties in life, when someone does something to hurt you, when someone says something about you that's not true, maybe it is true. Or maybe it's half true. And usually that's, that's what's out there are the half truths. When people want to gossip about you, when, when you're involved in, you know, activities and, and you get personalities involved, and I mean, you know, you get five Baptists together, you got seven different opinions. So you know how that is. You say, how do we resolve that? Well, the answer is not 
to get angry. The answer is not to gossip. The anger, answer is not to talk to everybody else about it and to badmouth that person. The answer is to get on our knees and to pray. And again, just to kind of close out, you know, it's really hard to be angry with a brother or sister in Christ if you are genuinely praying for them. Well, I'm praying for you. I love you guys. I miss you. Uh, I miss having having this uh, this room uh, filled with folks and and to just have the fun together and the joy together and. Uh, to hear from you. If there's any way that I can pray for you, any way that I can help you, you let me know. And I look forward to the time that we can get back together. i tell you what we are going to do, uh, or what we need to do, is I know we're most probably going to miss Easter uh, uh, as far as, as a corporate gathering. Uh, and we will celebrate Easter this Sunday. But why don't we make the Sunday, the first Sunday that we're able to be back corporately worshiping together in the sanctuary. Let's make that Resurrection Day. We'll figure out, I don't know what, what that's going to look like. I don't know how we're going to do it. But let's just treat it like that's Easter Sunday. Uh, when I used to travel to Ukraine, we would usually be there over their Easter. And so I would be at my church on Easter Sunday, and Orthodox Easter was always a week later. It's kind of weird how their calendar worked that way. So I got to celebrate Easter twice. It was awesome. Well, it's not about what day we might say it is. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus, and you know that. So somehow, we're going to figure this out. Resur Easter Sunday is every Sunday. But let's, uh, let's have a gathering back together where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and make the next Sunday that we're together, the next time we're together will be Resurrection Sunday. We'll talk more about it. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm thankful for the church family and those outside of our church family that uh, watch these videos, and I pray your blessing to be on them. And Thank you, Lord, for the grace of Christ where we can literally learn to walk together, to live together, to love each other. And I pray that we will learn how to show grace to each other and mercy. We are all fallen. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but you have raised us up. We once were dead, but in Christ, you have made us alive. And Father, we're thankful. We ask your blessing on us, your presence to be so very real to us. And we thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name, Jesus, our Savior, that I pray. Amen.